Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming. I'd like to uh, thank Abdullah for coming along and to all of our Muslim friends here tonight. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's a very important topic that we've got here, the question of, is the Quran miraculous? Why are we asking this topic? Well, we're asking it because it's a topic that Muslims are often referring to and using as a way of promoting the Quran and Islam. They will say that, uh, you will see this in the books that are distributed on the Islamic tables in the universities. There will be lectures on this, and Abdullah himself has done lectures on this. There are many clips on YouTube about this topic, and there are articles about it all saying that the Quran is miraculous, and that this therefore uh, proves that it is unique and from God. And it's also related to it that it's the proof that Muhammad is the tr a true prophet. Throughout uh, the Quran, when you read it, Muhammad is challenged on many occasions to produce a miracle, and the only miracle that is really put forward is that of the Quran, as it says on point A on your notes there. If you are in doubt concerning that which we revealed unto our slave, Muhammad, then produce a surah of the like thereof. The hadiths, some say he did miracles, others say he didn't, but the Quran, I think, is quite clear that the, the miracle of Muhammad is primarily the Quran. And so the Quran is his great miracle. It's the evidence for him being a genuine prophet. And I guess, from, uh, as we've just heard from Abdullah, it's the assurance that Muslims have that Islam is right. And I think from an, uh, an application of this is that what it means is that because the Quran is miraculous, it means that they don't really need to listen to the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel that were before uh, the Quran and that they can read these and... Uh, except what, what agrees with the Quran and they feel that, that this is quite acceptable because of, of actually what the Quran is. Well, is the Quran miraculous? You may have been brought up believing this or you may have a Muslim friend uh, asking you about this. Tonight I want to briefly consider uh, the, the areas that Muslims are putting forward before us as they tell us that it's miraculous. So I'm going to look at, firstly, what is a miracle? And then I'm going to look at, does the Quran really say that it's a unique miracle? I'll look at, is it miraculous guidance? Uh, was it miraculously given by God? Is it miraculously beautiful? Uh, does it have no contradictions? Is it miraculously preserved? And uh, is it a scientific miracle? And I'll look at the miraculous letters. And uh, I may be saying some things that are hard for you to listen to as well. And again, I just ask that you be patient and let me present my case. First of all, what is a miracle? I just want to uh, talk about a miracle in the most basic terms, and that is it's obviously got to be something that you can see, that that is recognisable. Jesus did miracles and he had people who were hostile to him, but they still had to acknowledge that he did those miracles. At point B of your notes, we'll see that uh, this was even the case for his disciples, where the Jewish leaders said, what are we going to do with these men? That is Jesus' disciples. They asked, everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. Now that they rejected them, they rejected Jesus, but they still had to acknowledge that this miracle had happened. And so, you know, when it comes to the Quran, we need to be able to see this miraculous element. My second point is, does the Quran really say that it is a unique miracle? And I want to say to that, no. It doesn't. Look at point C on your notes there. Say unto them, Muhammad, then bring a scripture from the presence of Allah that give clearer guidance than these two that I may follow it if you are truthful. Now, Surah 28 is about uh, Muhammad and Moses and paralleling Muhammad's life to Moses' life. And the Torah is actually parallel to the Quran and it's said to produce something like either of these. And so this claim of the Quran being unique and miraculous is actually something not just for the Quran, but it's also for the Torah and presumably to the other holy books. It's only mentioning the Torah in this context because it's only talking about Muhammad, but it would be you'd have to establish the case why it wouldn't have, um, apply anywhere else. So the Quran's actually not saying that it is unique, and I've given you the references there. It is saying that at least the Torah and most likely the other books are saying that as well. Now, point three, does the Quran give miraculous guidance? We see this in the publications that are presented before Christians and uh, the non-Muslim non world, and probably to Muslims as well. You can see this at point D there in your notes. Everything which a man needs, both in terms of his spiritual and social life, is contained and explained in the Quran. 
But I want to say that that's actually not the case. These claims are made about the Quran, that it contains everything a man needs, but you don't have to know much of Islam to know that a significant amount of Islam is based upon the Hadith. And so the Quran just by itself would not have, you would not just have Islam. The Quran is based not, Islam is not just based on the Quran, it's based on the Quran and on the Sunnah. And the books of the Hadith are very large collections. Muslims treat them very differently. Shias have, a, have different sets of hadiths. And a large part of Islam is actually based upon this. So the, the Quran is not miraculous guidance in providing everything. It, it actually provides certainly significant things, but many significant essential things comes from outside of the Quran. And so I don't see it as miraculous guidance since uh, Islam is so dependent upon these other sources. Now, Point four, was the Quran miraculously given by God? I think one of the, the common points that are put forward to, put to Christians is that Muhammad was illiterate and that because he was an illiterate man, then something as beautiful as the Quran couldn't come from somebody who was illiterate. I guess my first point I would want to make about that is that to say that type of thing is actually quite racist against people who, who aren't literate because many ancient cultures were not literate. Literacy has come late in human history and pre-literate cultures had l large oral traditions. Many cultures were oral traditions and they had their oral epics. They had their classical works which were preserved in oral form. So just because you, you're illiterate, it doesn't mean that you're not capable of great things. You just can't have that view of human culture. But also, I'm not convinced that Muhammad actually was illiterate. The phrase that is used, that is translated that way, is this word, ummi. But I've given you a reference there, to, I've given you all the references to that word in the uh, Arabic, uh, in the Quran, and you see it at point F. That it actually doesn't mean illiterate, it, it actually means of the group of people who don't have a scripture. And so, this is something that Muslims themselves will bring up, and you, you can find this. Let me read to you point E. He it is who has sent among the unlettered ones, the Ummi, a messenger of their own, to recite unto them revelations and to make them grow and to teach them scripture and wisdom beforehand, uh, beforehand they were indeed in error manifest. And so you see, he, here's the word Ummi. It doesn't mean the illiterate ones. It just means the Meccans, the, the, the people who didn't have a scripture. And I'd encourage you to look up those other references. Certainly when we read the, the Hadiths, there are many Hadiths which talk about Muhammad actually writing. So I've got one there at point F, narrated by Abbas. The prophet said, come near and let me write for you a writing after which you will never go astray. And there are many of that type of Hadith. Muhammad was also a trader. And if you're involved in the business of trading, there is some type of record keeping that is involved in that. So I don't believe that Muhammad was illiterate. I don't think there's actually evidence for that. And so I don't see that that represents a miraculous giving of the Quran. The second point I'd like to look at under the miraculous giving of the Quran is that the claim is that it's come straight from God to the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. And that it's this simple process, that there's no editing, it's simply given through him and then it's been dictated from him to others. But please look at point G there. Narrated by Al-Bara, there was revealed, not equal are those believers who sit at home and those who strive and fight in the cause of Allah. And that's from Surah 9, uh, 4 verse 95. The prophet, called, uh, prophet said, Call Zayd for me and let him bring the writing board, the ink pot and the pen. Then he said, Right, not equal are those believers who sit. And at that time, Amir bin Umm Maktab, the blind man, was sitting behind the prophet. He said, O oh, Allah's apostle, what is your order for me as regard to this verse? As I am a blind man. So the verse said that those who, who stay at home and don't go out and join Muhammad in the jihad, they're not equal to those Muslims, sorry, they are higher than the Muslims who stay at home. If you stay at home and don't join Muhammad, you're not as equal as those who go out. And a blind man calls out and says, but what about me? I can't go out on the battlefield. And have a look at the next part. So instead of the above verse, the following verse was revealed. Not equal are those believers who sit at home except those who are disabled and those who strive and fight in the cause of Allah. And so the verse is given once. A blind man raises a, a question. The verse is then given again within an extended part 
to take that into account. Now, if this really was the miraculous word of God, surely God would get it right the first time. And I've given you the references there. It's in Bukhari, Muslim, Matawatir. There's actually a verse which seems to be picking up this idea at point H. And when we exchange a verse in place of another verse, and God knows very well what he is sending down, they say to Muhammad, thou art a mere forger. And so this verse seems to be trying to explain this situation that we've just read in the Hadith, where Muhammad says one thing, it is changed in some way, and they're saying, look, you're changing it, you're a forger. And the, the word from Allah is that, well, it's Allah who's doing this. But again, it doesn't look miraculous. It looks like somebody is editing this in response to, to the situations of his life. Now, I wanted to look at uh, point five now, and that is that the Quran is miraculous and in beauty, and uh, that there is nothing like it, and Abdullah has touched upon this. All I want to simply say here is that every culture has their classical, beautiful works. I do not doubt that the Quran is beautiful Arabic. I don't doubt that. The Arabs are famous for their poetry. They're famous for their oratory. I don't doubt that the Quran is a classical Arabic work. But the Chinese have got their classical works. The English have got their classical works. The Aboriginal cultures around the world have got their classical works. And if I said to you, produce something better than the Chinese works, who's actually in a position to do that? If I said, produce something better than William Shakespeare, who's going to do that? The people who love William Shakespeare will never believe you anyway. Because they love him. And no matter how good you are, they will never believe you. So that this test is highly sub subjective. It, also one of the things I find is that people say to me, oh, it's so beautiful. And I, I've asked them, I said, can you understand Arabic? And they say, no, I don't. I can't understand Arabic. And so what they mean by beautiful is the performance... It's the performance of the Quran. They, they're not listening to the meaning. They don't actually understand the meaning. It's the beautiful performance. And I actually think that that's something we need to be careful of. Because performance can be deceptive. It's the meaning that actually matters. And if something is beautifully recited, if something is beautifully performed, like advertising on the TV or music videos, which are, they spend a lot of time giving a really good performance, very often to give a really unhelpful message. So the performance by itself it is not a measure of whether or not something is true, just because something is beautifully performed. I'd actually like to give a, a part of the Bible now for us to consider at point I. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now that is beautiful. And this is actually beautiful in any language. It can be translated into any language. Uh, I've read the Quran several times now. I've never actually found something as beautiful as that. I'm happy for something to be shown. I haven't found in the Quran anything that compares to the piercing insight of the Sermon of the Mount by Jesus, or the visions of John in the book of Revelation, or the parables of Jesus, or the wisdom of Solomon in the book of Proverbs, or just the complete stories that the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel have, or the prayers in the Psalms, or the descriptions at length of the second coming of Jesus, or the passion of the Song of Songs, or the lamentations of Jeremiah or the reflection of Ecclesiastes, or the wisdom of God in Job. I've got a list of, of some of those readings there, but I'd encourage you to have a look at the beauty of the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, and the Gospel. And the beauty with these, and the miraculous things with these, is that these can all be translated. The sixth point I wanted to look at now was that the Quran contains no contradictions. And uh, this is a point J on your notes. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from other than God, they would have surely have found therein much discrepancy. Now, 
Now, I've read the Quran carefully, and, and I guess for, for many Muslims would believe this who haven't read it carefully, others would have read it, would have read it carefully. But I've certainly found what I consider to be uh, contradictions, and I'll point some of these out now. So when we have the, the two accounts in the Quran of Mary uh, being told that she is to give birth to Jesus, in one account, two angels come to her. In the other account, it's the Spirit of God, or Gabriel as it's translated, but it's one, and they actually say slightly different things, even though it's exactly the same event. Let me read to you from uh, a description of the creation of the heavens and the earth. In Surah 2, verse 29, it says, It is he who created for you all that is in the earth. Then he lifted himself to the heaven and levelled them seven heavens. So there's the creation of the earth and then the levelling of the seven heavens. But in Surah 79, verse 27 to 30, it says, What, are you stronger in constitution, all the heaven he built? He lifted up its vault and levelled it and darkened its night and brought forth its forenoon and the earth and that he spread it out. And so in this account we've got the heavens first and then the earth second. And so it's just a, a different order. We've got different orders, we've got di different things when it comes to punishments. These are point L, M and N. At point L, uh, for an adulterer or a fornicator, they're to be whipped a hundred times. But then uh, later on, uh, for, for, people, for women who commit a, a indecency or adultery, they're to be detained in their houses. But then later on in the Hadith, it's stoning. And you can see different Islamic groups which apply those differently. But they're all there for the same offence. There's also what actually happens to you on Judgment Day at point O and D. At point O we see that Allah is going to multiply for the Muslim his good deeds by ten and just count his bad deeds as one. But in D it says that he's going to uh, only receive the best of his good deeds and overlook his bad deeds. So in one account of the Judgment Day, it's multiplied by ten and not the bad ones counted. But on the other one, it's the good will be counted and the bad ones overlooked. And so again, it's a different description. I think one of the ones that concerns Christians is uh, what we see when it comes to how to treat Christians. At point Q, we see that uh, initially the Muslims were to rejoice when the Greeks, the Christians, had beaten the Persians. And so there's a rejoicing at, at Christian military conquest. But in point R, in uh, chapter 9, verse 29, well, the, the, these same Christians are now to be conquered and subjugated. So fight those who believe not in God in the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden. Such men as practice not the religion of truth, being those who have been given the book, the Christians and Jew, Jews, until they pay the tribute out of hand and have been humbled. So early in Muhammad's life, when the Christians win, that's great, good for the Christians. But right towards the end of his life, conquer the Christians, subjugate them and reduce them in number. So it's quite a different message. To us that is just a, a straight, a, a, a worrisome contradiction. The seventh point I want to look at was that the Quran is miraculously preserved. And this is something we're told and Abdullah has touched upon. But what I want to say is if you read the Hadiths, and these are Matawati Hadiths, we see that certainly it was memorised, but it was memorised differently by Muhammad's companions. You can see at point <coughs> S there that one group of Muslims were reciting the Quran by the male and the female, but another group were reciting it by him who created male and female. <coughs> And so that actually changes the subject of the sentence. In one, you're swearing by, you're taking an oath by creation. In the next one, you're taking an oath by God. So it changes the subject of the sentence. And uh, the, if you read it there, you'll see that the, the, the Muslim who's bringing this up is saying, I'm only going to recite what I heard from the Prophet. I'm not going to follow them. This led to Uthman, the third Islamic ruler, standardising one version of the Quran and burning the rest. And that's at point T. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. And at point U, we read about one of Muhammad's uh, 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 famous companions, Abdullah ibn Masud, and he said regarding this, O oh, you Muslim people, avoid copying the Musaf and the revelation of this man. And he's referring to Uthman's uh, recension of the Quran here, Uthman's version. And so there's actually evidence, uh, much of our tier evidence, of uh, the companions of Muhammad not all agreeing 
with this standard version of the Quran. In fact, there are different, slightly different versions of the Quran today in what's called the different Qur'ats of the Quran, which have the dots and dashes in different places. And uh, again, we can have, have a look at some of those, but there's uh, the one according to Imam uh, al-Juri, al-Hafs, uh, al-Wash, and um, I've forgotten the other one now. Uh, and so there are these slight differences even today. So we don't see that it's been miraculously preserved. We see that it's been preserved uh, in a very standardised way. I'll briefly look at this, uh, this topic of the, of the science, the science of, the, uh, of the Quran. And again, if you get the books, there's, there's any amount of videos on YouTube about this and books about how, the, how scientific the Quran is. But I was actually just talking to a Muslim man who'd become a Christian and he actually, one of the things that made him leave was this, the Quran's description of embryology. Have a look at point uh, V on your notes. Then we created of a drop of semen a clot. Then we created of the clot a tissue. Then we created of the tissue bones. Then we garmented the bones in flesh. And uh, he said to me that he was, he's actually studying embryology. And he said that it was this verse for him that first began to make him doubt because this process of the formation of the embryo, of there being bones and then the bones being clothed flesh is actually wrong. The bones are made inside the flesh as one unit and this order that is put out here is just incorrect. It, these types of things just go on and on. There's a man named Harun Yahya that you may know of. And he says from Surah 16, verse 66 to 69 about the honeybees. And he talks about how the miracle of the honeybees, because it talks about the bees doing certain things. And he says that the things that the bees are described as doing, only female bees do. And that the miraculous thing is that in the Arabic, the, the word for bee is in the female. And so how would it know that that's the case? But the problem with that is, in the verse just before it, it talks about the cattle from whom you get milk. And the word cattle there is in the masculine. Right? So from male cows you get milk. It actually doesn't work. I'm not saying that the Quran's unscientific. I'm just saying that there is a huge amount of exaggeration that goes on about how scientific the Quran is. Now you may say, yeah, but there are so many people, so many scientists who write about how wonderful the Quran is and we've got their quotes. Well, it's very interesting that some reporters from the Wall Street Journal several years ago interviewed these scientists and they found out that the scientists were given first class travel and accommodation for them and their wives to an Islamic conference where they were pressed to concede that the Quran was miraculous. Professor Hay from the German Marine Institute said, I fell into that trap and then I warned other people to watch out against it. So these Islamic institutions that are saying how scientific the Quran is, you need to understand the tactics they are using and investigative journalists have now followed that up and I've given you the article, you can look it up. The final one I want to look at is just how how Muslims will make anything a miracle. So look at point nine uh, in your notes with that, that photocopied page. It says here, the, the first part of this verse of the Quran is, Aleph, Lam, Mim. And you'll see in, in the reference there, the translators have put, these, word, these letters are one of the miracles of the Quran. So, Aleph, Lam, Mim. Now, if Aleph, Lam, Mim, so A, L, M, if that's a miracle, if that is a miracle, then what would you call this watch? If ALM is a miracle. See, if ALM is a miracle, then anything is a miracle, isn't it? Basically what's happening is the people who are talking about this in the way of the Quran, they love the Quran. They already believe it's from God. And so they just search for anything they can to prove it. And so, as I said, they'll say things about honeybees and ALM and things which just aren't miraculous... They, they claim are miraculous. So to conclude, is the Quran miraculous? No. When it's examined, it is not miraculous in any of the way that Muslims claim. Muslims who claim this start with the assumption that the Quran is miraculous and then set out to prove it. But examining the evidence itself would never lead to this conclusion. This means that there is no evidence, uh, it's not a miracle, and that it, there's no evidence for Muhammad being a prophet. And I finally just want to say... I hope that you will not think that the Quran being a miracle is a reason why you can turn away from reading the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. God has given us his word and the Quran is certainly not miraculous enough for us to turn away from them. Thank you very much.